We are live. <clears throat> not not to be confused with alive. This isn't Memorex. This is live. Sony. <clears throat> Boy, I told your age. All right. Best cassette tapes out there. Let me go ahead and uh, shift this this way just a little bit. And uh, I'm going to turn over to Earl after we pray. And bless Adonai for the good land he has given us. <clears throat> Avinu Malkeno, our Father, our King, we thank you for the food we have received. We have eaten and we are satisfied. And we thank you for the land in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, Brother Earl, take it away. Book of Chronicles. Breha Yamim Aleph. Okay, as we stated last week, Chronicles looks forward to the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom. Uh -huh. And it's ending with the return. So in the first chapter is a list of names, right? Well, this is where it starts. And it starts going through. Adam was born in the first year. And he's generation one. So why am I talking about generations? Well, because the Messiah is the 75th generation. And in the scripture, it says a day, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. And when back in Genesis, I believe it was, uh, let's see, Genesis. Did you say Messiah was 75th generation? He was the 75th generation. Okay. So we go back to Genesis, and this is where I'm going with it. It has to do with Adam. Okay. When the Lord told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree in the garden. Mm -hmm. Okay. He said, because in that day, you will surely die. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, you should not eat. For in that day, you shall surely die. And then the serpent told Eve, you will not surely die. But the fact was, he said, in that day, you shall surely die. And a day to the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So, we start off with Adam, year one, generation one. And his son, Seth, who was born in the year 130, okay, uh, he was generation two. And then we go to Enosh, okay, he's year uh, generation three and born in the year three, tw uh, 235. And then his son, Canaan was born in the year 325. That's the fourth generation. And Mahalalel, he was born in the year 395. He's the fifth generation. And Jared, the sixth generation, was born in year 460. Now we get to the interesting part. Born in the year of 622 is Enoch. Enoch is the seventh generation. Enoch walked with God and was not. For I believe he lived, took my page, 365 years rough. Yeah, 365 years. I believe that's how long he lived, and then he died. Actually, he was taken up. So the pattern here is the seventh generation. That's a picture of Messiah because the Lord took him up. That's That's my take on it. And then uh, from Enoch, we go to Methuselah, okay? And Methuselah is generation number eight. And then the son of Methuselah, Lamech, is number nine. And then in the 10th generation is Noah. Not only that, but Lamech lived 777 years. Interesting. Just interesting, that's all. So it was the year 1,651 years after, that's when he died, 1,651 years after uh, creation. 
So as we go further on, this is where this is where we're going to go with this. We're going to go more into the generations and, and, and the years that they live and the time when they died up to the up to the flood, which is one thousand six hundred and fifty six. If I'm not mistaken, Noah was the 10th generation from Adam. So just remember that. OK, and you had something to say. Uh, both Lamech and Methuselah died the year of the flood. Um, yeah, there's a difference on Lamech. He died four or five years before the flood. But yes, Methuselah did die. That's what we have the year of the flood. And what's interesting is, is in that, I think it's in Genesis 5. Don't quote me, but we're going to go down there. Say, what does this got to do with Chronicles? Well, it's the son of and the son of and the son of. It's the list. It's generations. So we're going through this little by little, and we're going to find some other interesting stuff when we get to it. Okay, Genesis 5. <clears throat> Okay. Noah means the one who will comfort us. And then we get to uh, and it came to pass on the sons of God saw people. My spirit not that's okay. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in, in verse 8, chapter 6, I'm sorry. And in verse 9, it says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And what that means when you go down into the Hebrew is Noah was a righteous man. And there was no one else because the earth in verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. There is speculation that some people believe that uh, Methuselah died the year of the flood and that he was also righteous, but I don't know what it says that Noah was. Uh, that's, that's just one thought that I've been told. But as you read it here, my take on it, my opinion is no one but Noah was the righteous. But there is room there for Methuselah. I don't know about Lamech, but that means, and if you look at it, not just Noah's dad, but his granddad possibly may have been uh, part of the unrighteous. But I don't, I don't necessarily think that. But it's just hard to say. You make your own decision. Didn't Adam die just shortly before Noah was born? Actually, that's a good question. You brought that up because. The last one to see uh, Noah, yeah, it's on this one right here, <clears throat> is Lamech. So Adam was alive while Lamech was born because Adam died in the year 930. Okay? And Lamech was born in the year 874. So he would have known Noah. We've been alive at the time. Yep, we've been alive. Noah was born in the year one one zero five six, so he wouldn't have known Adam. Who? Noah. 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 So all the other generations would have known of Adam because they were descendants of Adam. So how much they knew, how much they spent with him, it's it's kind of hard to say. But what's interesting here is also, notice, uh, Enoch walked with God because he chose to walk with God. Noah was the same. He was perfect in all his ways. So where I'm going with that is the earth was filled with violence and everybody there... Uh, basically was not walking with God and did God relented on the fact that he made man. But these two guys who quote unquote, as I'll, I'll say, as everybody talks about the Holy Spirit, whether they had the Holy Spirit or not, it wasn't given to man at this time, but yet they chose to walk with God. 
So is our walk dependent upon having the Holy Spirit? Or is it something we get to choose to do? And then the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is there to help and guide us <clears throat> with the Torah, with the word itself. So that's a good question. Anything else? I'm all out. Got a joke. It fits. <laughs> Okay. Who's uh, the oldest man who ever lived? Whose father never died? Who's the oldest man who ever lived? Whose father never died? Enoch. Whose father never died? Methuselah. <laughs> Sorry. The obvious answer was correct. Okay. Well, that's that's all I got for now. That was. My time limit, 15 minutes. Well, you could have 20 if you need it. 30 if you need it. I don't want to prepare for 15. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That's all right. <laughs> Next time I'll prepare for 30 just in case. Just in case. Just in case you, if it goes over, it goes over. That's how it goes, man. Okay. That's good. That's all right. Good well, appreciate it. <clears throat> it's interesting, though, you say about... Um, what were you what were you getting at with the seventh generations? What was that about? The seventh generation was Enoch, which is interesting because being the seventh generation, it uh, kind of coincides with uh, right like the land. Every seven years, the seventh year is the land of rest. So here you have the seventh generation being Enoch. Enoch was a righteous man who walked with God. And God took him because he was righteous. He was a friend of God, so to speak. So I looked at that and saw, in my own opinion, a type and shadow of Messiah being the seventh generation. But what is, what is, okay, so how do you relate the seventh generation to Messiah? <sighs> That's a good question. I'll have to go and look at that. Okay. Well, this, uh, well, in the genealogy in Matthew, is it? He's not s the seventh well, generation. Well, well, it's right, but when it's, fourteen, it's, a, it's fourteen, a fourteen, 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 David, 14, David, 14. David. So, so it's, it's it's a, a, actually a derivative, so for sure. I mean, but, yeah. yeah, it's like this super seven, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. sort of. So. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's look more into that. Maybe I can find <clears throat> something. Okay. Awesome. All right, so um, we'll move to Shlach Lecha, send you or send for yourselves, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's kind of what we'll look at, um, a commandment to send or not. Caleb, the spies, the descendants of Anak, uh, or Anak, or the Nephilim, uh, wanting to go back to Egypt. Caleb's spirit, if someone sins by mistake or defiant sin, and Tzitzitz. Any questions? Yeah, those caves aren't big enough. Yeah, right? Yeah, those, mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty interesting. We'll talk about those just a little bit. And this is the first two verses. Send men to spy out the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. Send one man from each tribe of their fathers, everyone a leader among them. Ish echad, ish echad. <clears throat> so the, the, the art scroll, Humash, says that uh, send forth you, for you may be understood to mean send for yourself. And based on that understanding, Yah isn't necessarily commanding them to send spies into the land. He's kind of authorizing it. If you want to, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. But I'm, I'm not commanding you to do it. Uh, so according to that view, Adonai is not actually commanding them, but uh, for whatever reason, they wanted to see it for themselves. And remember at one point, it mostly said it was good in his eyes. So they sent the people, right? So let's take a look at uh, Devarim 1, 19 to 36. Let's see if we have a, a discrepancy between those two descriptions. The room 1, 19 to 36. It goes a little something like this. I'm reading from the ISR. <clears throat> 
Oh, it would help if I'm starting chapter 1 and not chapter 2. <laughs> then we set out from Horeb, went through all the great and awesome wilderness, which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites. Sadonai Elohim had commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which Adonai or Elohim is giving us. See, Adonai or Elohim has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as Adonai or Elohim of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear, nor be discouraged. And all of you came near to me and said, Let us send men before us. Let them search out the land for us and bring back word by the way which we should go up and of the cities into which we should come. And the matter was good in my eyes. I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, and they turned and went up to the mountains and came to the Wadi Eshkol and spied it out. And they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us, saying, The land which Adonai or Elohim is giving us is good. But you would not go up and rebelled against the mouth of Adonai your Elohim and grumbled in your tents and said, Because Adonai was hating us, he has brought us out of the land of Mitzrayim to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going to? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are greater and taller than we, and the cities are great, walled up the heavens, and we saw the sons of the Anakim there too. Then I said to you, Have no dread or fear of them. Adonai your Elohim who is going before you, he does fight for you according to all he did for you in Mitzrayim, before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how Adonai your Elohim has borne you, as said, as a man bears his son in all that you do, you went until you came to this place. Yet in this matter, you're putting no trust in Adonai your Elohim, who is going before you in the way to seek out the place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go in fire by night and a cloud by day. Adonai heard the voice of your words and was wroth and took an oath, saying, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, son of Yephuna. He shall see it. And to him and his children, I give the land on which he walked because he followed Adonai completely. So do we have a discrepancy between these two descriptions? What do you think? Doesn't sound like it. Especially if it wasn't it wasn't a command to send them up, and it was just a okay. I guess you can. It's fine if you want to. What do you think, Wayne? Well, there seems to be different, sort of different um, points of view. point of view. That's the right term. Mm -hmm. um, so I think <clears throat> we hear that uh, we we see that in Devrim is typically thought to be Moshe's Moshe's own point of view. Um, so that's. Um, Moshe read, reading this um, starting in in 119 where uh, he described or verse 22 where it says that all of you approached me and said let us send men before us so it was verse 23 says uh, it pleased me whereas we in our uh, Torah portion this week it said shlach gas and for yourself which is really it seems like it's you look at it on the face of it certainly in translation it might be different but it seems like it's um, Moshe's option. Uh, Moshe gave in, so to speak, or agreed with their uh, plea to send men. Um, he said, the okay, thing pleased me, was from New York Standard. He said, I took, and I took 12 of your men, one for each tribe. So saying, putting it that way, saying Moshe sent them, whereas in our in our Torah portion, it's sin for yourself. And it, often, it, can, it could read, like, if you don't translate it that way, it might just say, if you just translate it as send, the 12 men, it might sound like a command from, from Yah to send them, but that's, that doesn't really appear to be the real real story here. And so looking at it with with, after, with the words being translated fully, it looks like there's not a, a discrepancy between the two, where you might just read where Numbers, Dura, uh, Devarim says, or Numbers of the Midbar says, send them, and Moshe, and Moshe here is saying, it pleased me, so I took them into one for each tribe. So to answer your question, in a summarized portion, no, there's not, there's not a description between right. the two. <laughs> that was a pretty quick summary. So, and interesting, I was listening, I don't know why it came up, but this week, uh, I was listening to K Love Radio in my truck, and they actually brought this up. And 
I, I can't remember the name of the pastor. Uh, I know everyone will know his name if I say it. Uh, Hispanic guy, Luis Palau. Yep. Luis Palau. And he said that God commanded them to send the spies. See mm -hmm. the misunderstanding there? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's out there. He did well, say that. God commanded them to send spies. He's, he did Mabinabar. It sounds like it right there in verse 1. Now, let's see if you travel at Shalach Lecha, as Shalach Lecha, as Lecha yeah. sin for yourself. If you, if you treat, leave out Lecha, don't translate that word. It makes you have sin. I see. This is amazing because it reminds, I don't know, it's a foretelling, it's saying not reminds, but of when Israel said, give us a king, give us a king. Mm -hmm. And God gave them Saul mm -hmm. after their own hearts. But it, you could tell it wasn't God's <laughs> Here's a king. He ain't going to like it, but here's a king yeah. anyway. Yeah, and right. it, well, I mean, what ensued afterwards in each part was death, destruction, loss of time yeah. to get the right place, get mm -hmm. to the right place. You know, so it, that's scary. And just for the record, I like Luis Palau. Yeah. So. There's several times it seems to be almost... Uh, style of scripture where you're told one incident in one place and later at the retelling of that incident it fills in more detail. Mm -hmm. right. Oh yeah, that happens a lot. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it seems like this is doing too. Fill it, filling in details that more than <laughs> Sure. Well, after getting explained Shalak like uh, I understand. I, I, I agree. Yep. Kelev. Let's talk about Kelev. What does Kelev mean in Hebrew? Dog. Dog. Yeah. Or from the heart. Yeah. Right. Did we ever call a dog Caleb? We have a good friend named Caleb Krauts who used to call him Kelev. But if you think about it, a dog is fierce and very loyal. Oh, that was a radio station. K. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mom. <laughs> Caleb is not from the tribe of Judah. By DNA, he is a Kenizzite. True. What do we think about that? Which was one of the Canaanites. One of the, pe one one of the people band. they're supposed to put under the ban, right? Mm -hmm. Kill them or whatever happens to them. Mm -hmm. A Kenizzite? No, don't say if, if, if there's a foreigner in your land, treat him the same way as one of your own. Isn't Except that? for son of Caleb, son of Yefuna, the Kenizzite, and Yehoshua, son of Nun, for they followed Hashem fully yep, from yep. art school. However, Judaism doesn't accept that Caleb's actual father was a Gentile from a tribe designated to be uprooted from the land. They got to spin it just a little bit, right? Oh, they're spinning, baby. And Caleb, son of Hezron, produced children with Azubah, his wife, and with Yerioth, and these were his her sons, Jesher and Shobab and Ardan, not to be confused with Jobab. <laughs> Jobab? <laughs> not to confuse with Jobab? <laughs> The son of Hezron, he was the son of Yefuna. It is because he turned, or Pana, from the conspiracy of the spies, and still there's a problem, for he was the son of Kenaz, as it was written. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger bro brother, took it. That is from... Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, Rabbah said he was a stepson of Kenaz. There we go. This is how they're going to try to explain this away. Now, pay attention, I think. Uh, Caleb, the son of Yefuna, the Kenizzite, and not the son of Kenaz in particular. That then indicates that Azuba was the same as Miriam. And that is why she called Azuba, because at first she was abandoned by all men as invalid. Gave birth, uh, Caleb begat Azuba, but he was married to her, right? So Rabbi Yochanan says, whoever marries a woman for the sake of heaven is credited by the scriptures as if he had given birth to her. What? Is that like my I'm my own grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> no, it really kind of is. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. And here's from Rashi, the Kenizzite. He, Caleb, was a stepson of Kenaz, who, to whom Caleb's mother bore Othniel. See Judges 3.9. That was from Talmud Sotah 11b. Commentary based on the works of the Lubavitch Rebbe. Uh, Caleb's father, Yefuna, had died and his mother married Kenaz. So Caleb was Kenaz's stepson. Has anyone ever seen any evidence of that in the scriptures? No. Nope. So Lubavitch Rebbe. 
So uh, I'll we're let uh, to the scriptures, Wayne which... take, a, take a look at this and uh, give some explanation. We can see uh, Ben Yafuna and Hakanazi there. Yeah, so just some translations seem, seem to try and, or um, I don't know, maybe not on purpose, but to mask the relationship in the words we're looking at. It's from Numbers 32, 12, and Joshua 14, 6. Those are parallels there. You see Ben um Ben Kanaz, Ben Kanaz, repeatedly in the book of Judges. Yeah. Um, so Ben Yifuna Hakanazi would be a cognate, I think, for Ben Kanaz, which is um, the same the same idea from that. And so you see those uh, back to back to back. See, so sometimes in Judges, um, once in Joshua, or it's once in Joshua, um, just after the uh, Ben Kanazi, or question of Ben Yifuna Hakanazi. Son of Yafuna Kennedy. So, yeah. um, so it's the the word used is Ot Otniel, and then it says that. So Otniel is in fact the son of Kenazite. So that's what said Ben Kenaz every time. So it's hard to um, hard to continue that um, argument if you look directly at the Hebrew text, in my view. Which means they're adding to scripture, and what's the Bible say about that? Well, they're making an interpretation of scripture. It's not really adding to it. They're yeah, not, they're not yeah. Really adding to it. They're interpreting it in a way that I don't think is accurate. They're not even. Following so try to explain away. Uh, well, yeah. they're, they're trying to explain it away by saying stuff that isn't there. And if they're saying stuff that isn't there, the well, it's just, because of the way it's written, they are adding to scripture. Well, to just up, they're trying careful to not to, to to explain what they're uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, just be careful not to. Uh, charge them misguidingly that's you don't want to be guilty of mostly shamra even though they're dead now uh but we really don't know their motivation but it appears to us that they're trying to just conceal the fact that he was a gentile right yeah that's that's the primary yeah. point of the, yeah. what would the purpose well here we'd be guilty i think if i were to, if it were me it would be a way to say hey Jewish bloodlines are pure. Oh, yes. In, in a Could similar be. matter to what we read, we read today in the text, in I guess it was in uh, Ben's reading, where it talked about there's one Torah mm -hmm. for the Ger and one to Torah for the the people, whatever whatever that verse was. Mm -hmm. um, how does Archbishop translate that word? Ger. Ger. It doesn't translate it as foreigner. It translates it as proselyte. Or convert. Or yeah. convert. Oh. So it's a way around having to have one tour for the gear as well as the homeborn. Mm. Yeah. And See, I, proselyte or convert is not a good definition right. for gear. Particularly when you're reading it when they're when it, in, reading it in so, numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So if you did that, then... Um, the verse we read, uh, read before the Torah, uh, before reading the Torah, I'm a gear on the earth. It's, yeah. I'm a proselyte? No, no, that doesn't fit. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> They're purposefully mistranslating. So, but uh, what about this quote from the Talmud? And Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger, younger brother, took it. Caleb said, the one who attacks Kiryat Safar and captures it, I will even give him my daughter, Achsa, for a wife. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, so he gave him his daughter, Achsa, for a wife. So there you kind of have it, right? That must have been worth it. Yeah, right? Well, it all, but, but it's his first cousin, right? Well, back then, I don't think they worried about that so much. Well, right, here we go. So first cousin marriages aren't specifically forbidden. Uh, this, this other way, this phrase here is Caleb's younger brother. Achi Kelev HaKatan. Ach does describe a relationship between Abraham and Lot and Laban and Jacob. And was Abraham and Lot, were they brothers? Mm -mm. Laban and Jacob, were they brothers? No. No, they were cousins. So yeah. it's, it's kinsmen. Kinsmen, yeah. Brothers-in-law for um, Jacob and... Mm -hmm. But I, I will, you'll yeah, probably for, hear me call all of you Aki. For, at some for, point, uh, yeah, for well, except for Lot and Abraham, it yeah, was except for Mrs. Uh, Lot was yeah. his nephew. <laughs> from what I understand, Lot was Abraham's nephew, 
and Leland, yeah, was brother. So Ahi here is translated as kinsman. Yeah. His younger kinsman, Othiel the Kenizite, captured it. So any questions about uh, Caleb being a Gentile? No, he definitely was. Was this? It, it was. That's well, at important. the time. At the time, this the place. I would say that's he wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I would like to ask if this was interpreted that way um, before Messiah. Was it interpreted that way? Don't know. I don't. I've not seen commentaries on it older than Mishnah, which does, which interprets it as. Um, is similar to how Rashi has talked about it. But they felt a need to explain it away for some reason yeah, at that sure. time. Like I don't know Yavne why. Kind of thing. Was it, I don't know did why. they go in and... So <laughs> what about the line of David? Somebody else must have asked them a question and they got offended or they didn't there's, know the answer. I'm guessing. Well, maybe. Oh. There's a few uh, it's just a uh, guess. Gentiles in the, in, the, in the line of David. So in the line of Messiah, you have uh, and we just read of one in, in the book of uh, Joshua. Rahab. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me it's that right Caleb right. is Rahab, the son of Bruce. a Kenizzite, but is not a Gentile. Right, you're right. He is definitely sojourning Co with the yeah, children of Israel. carry that through because of belief, so to speak. He is a he is a follower of the Most High by faith, just like Ruth. Yeah. And just like Rahab. It looks like his dad was, too. Yeah, with that joint. He was considered one of the mighty men of the leaders to be chosen to go on that return. Right, yep. Mm -hmm. he, he was, was definitely considered the, part of the tribe of Judah. Yeah, a leader of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. Yep. So I guess where I'm going with that is it seems like they're trying to take out anything that would taint the Messianic line, or not that he's in the line, but my point being is. <clears throat> God's trying to show, in my own opinion, mm -hmm. that the line of Messiah was not perfect. It, it, the line wasn't perfect with people, and it wasn't perfect mm -hmm. with Jewish people. So I don't think it really matters. People are people. Yeah. People, people always has, he has a plan. He's going to carry out the plan yeah. no matter what we do. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I, I think it was also the point, um, the reason it was brought up that he was Kenizzite was because, so that people would understand that just because you were a Gare, you were not part of before, mm -hmm. you can become part of now. Yeah. Sure. Ephesians chapter two. Mm -hmm. yep, yes, very and good. I just listened that this morning, those who were far off but have been now mm -hmm. brought near. Yeah, that's that's good. Let's move on. Uh, the 10 spies, send one man from each tribe. Who represents Levi? I didn't see a name. How come? Because they don't get a piece of land. <laughs> Pretty good. Hoshea, Yehoshua represents Ephraim. Caleb, son of a Kenizzite, represents Yehuda. The significance of Joshua and Caleb, converts in the temple, and when, when did the spies report? So let's keep going. Bamidbar, send men on your behalf to reconnoiter the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel from each ancestral tribe. Send someone who is a leader in his tribe. This is not really a spy mission, but a leader's recon. But they always say it's the 10 spies, right? Mm -hmm. I like leader's Bible translation of reconnoiter. Like that. Reconnoiter. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a recon mission. Yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised how many people don't realize that's a word. <laughs> what, reconnoiter? Reconnoiter, huh? Yeah. I said it to my brother one time. I say we need to go reconnoiter this camping spot. He goes, "What? What does reconnoiter mean?" They, they just didn't right. know their grandparents because <laughs> yeah. grandpa our grandparents always say that, you know. Yeah. So the descendants more acceptable and more known recon. <laughs> recon, which is just a short version. If you, if you say of the word recon, it means you have camel paint on your face. So. Yeah. <laughs> Rick reconnoiter does camel that. paint. And nice. If you, and if you say the word force recon, the camo. You're a hardcore dude. Right, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'd say every no. bit the equivalent Only of an army ranger. One. Mm -hmm. Every army bit what? the equivalent of oh, an army so ranger. they all went to high school? What do you know? Yeah. So did you. And that's <laughs> no, it. Was college. Me too. <laughs> huh? I watched Dad in the first week. Was he? Uh -huh. Right on. That's good stuff. Jump and scuba qualified, I'm sure. Yeah. Land darts. <laughs> Who are you? Hey, man. 
They had a song made after us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> Does it involve crunchies or not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to keep going. Uh, and they went up to the south and came to Hebron. Now, Himan, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now, Hebron had been built seven years before it's on in Mitzrayim. And they gave the children of Israel an evil report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land to which we have gone as spies is the land eating up its inhabitants. And the people whom we saw there were of great size. We saw there the Nephilim, sons of Anak, of the Nephilim, and were like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we were in their eyes. These essentially were the descendants of Anak, since we could we do meet them again later, okay? In, in Joshua, son of Caleb, Yafuna gave a portion in the midst of the children of Yehuda, according to the command of Adonai, to Yehosa, Kirat Arba, that is Hebron, Arba, was the father of Anak. And Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shashai, Haiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. But were any of those the Nephilim? That depends on who you talk to. You can see there the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Bereshit 6 4. You got to go back to that. Yeah. And also yeah. afterward, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name. Were those really the Nephilim? What, what does no. Nephilim actually Not. mean? We've, we've studied this out several times, um, and there's going to be several different opinions. One prevailing opinion is fallen angels had sex with the daughters of men, and the offspring were the Nephilim, and they were giants. What's the actual word Hebrew? Oh. What is it? Nephal, fallen ones. Oh, fallen. And you can really trace that down and dig down deep. You'll kind of see that... In my personal opinion, and maybe Wayne's, I don't know, I think they were Persians. Aryans, Persians. What do you well, think? Good argument. Yeah. You agree? Absolutely. Well. And not the well, sons of fallen angels. Do you have the, the slides that talk about that? I don't. It wasn't in here. Okay. It's different, different, stuff. Mm, different class. Yeah. There's only so much you can put in a, or, or we'd be here till tomorrow, which is fine with me, but oh, I not fine with those that have kids. I have heard of three that isn't in the slide package you have there. Oh, yes. It's oh, talks about what's your theory? I've heard a theory about the bottom of page six. Because they weren't technically human. They were counted among the animals and were brought on the ark. Well, let me just let me ask. Would you, it's a oh, theory. It's something oh, yeah. I've heard. It's so there is one that says. So if you if you go with what the Bible says, it just everyone wasn't. except Noah and his family were killed in the flood. But there is a ridiculous thing out there that says Og, one of the Nephilim, clung to the top of the ark during the entire time. Use the ark as a life preserver. Yeah. There's no, no biblical evidence of that whatsoever. Yeah. So. Okay. Was there a drone that flew over its off? <laughs> I, I, I follow after that. I believe that they may have been angels fallen. And I go back to Jude for this one in six. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, um, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That doesn't say anything about them having sex with human women. I didn't say it did. I said, but because of this, they left their proper domain. That lends to, eh, it could have been, I don't know. Yeah. But I go, I go down that road because that's what I was taught. And I, and I, and I could, I could understand that, but I'm not saying that's exactly hundred percent. I'm just saying I lend that direction because two, you had Goliath and you had these others. I think they were freaks of nature. Were they a part of the Nephilim? I, I believe that, in my own opinion, they were not, because of Noah, the Nephilim that were whatever that was there died off. They didn't get on the ark and they weren't saved. I believe that man's evil mischievousness down the road caused that to come back somehow. And maybe that picked it up again. I don't do, know. You, do you find that anywhere in Scripture? Just these verses. But because of Goliath and a few of the others. Now, that's my own opinion. 
I don't put a lot of stock in it because it's, it doesn't, it's not a salvation issue to me. So if it is, if it isn't, I don't know. I figure I'll wait to see the video. Okay. Well, before we go, I, I know you got a, a slide you can talk about on this. I, I, I kind of took the position that those angels that left their proper abode mm -hmm. as they were of the angels that rebelled with Asatan and left the place they should be for a place they shouldn't be. That's just, uh, that's kind of how I took it. I'm not trying to disparage your point of view, uh, but that's, it's kind of how I took it. And there's, there are arguments for fallen angels, the mighty men of name, men of renown, that kind of thing. And there's, and it's widespread. Uh, they're just, mm -hmm. it's there's widespread. Of, more people believe that I think than, than what I personally have come to believe. Okay. So, well, and we and we might not ever know until Yeshua comes back. But. Right. I don't. Uh, how would you say it? I put it in its own little box, set it up there. That's just what I think. Yeah. Until one day yeah. I, I find something different that says, "Nope, that's the wrong way." Yep. Got it. What do you, you got a slide there? Well, I'd rather not just go down too much of a rabbit trail on on that. There's just too many different things. That's what that. we you know, the, yeah, I got gotcha. you. The what thing is, is in Genesis when it talks about the Nephilim, it starts with the sons of God saw the daughters of men were attractive. And then it says, then they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. And then he's, then Adam and I said, my spirit will not live in you, um, live in human beings forever, for they too are flesh. Therefore my life. Um, and, then, and then it says the Nephilim were in the earth and the, were on the earth in those days. It doesn't even say that they... Does, Actually, wait a minute. Describe. And also, after afterwards, when the sons of God came to into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were the ancient heroes, the men of renown. It doesn't even say that the heroes were the Nephilim exactly. It says there were Nephilim, mm -hmm. which every other translator, I mean, whenever they translated later, was giants was giants. Um, so, but it mentions the sons of God as opposed to. So it seems like there were two separate groups going on here. Um, it doesn't say that the Nephilim were the children of the the sons of God or angels or whatever they were. Um, it just says they were in the earth in those days. Yeah. So there's actually there's two, there's two different spellings of the word Nephilim in yeah. Scripture, um, and one of the and, um, Nephilim only appears a couple times in Scripture, and in uh, our our verse uh, numbers Midbar 1333, it uses uh, one of the alternate spellings when it uses Nephilim, but not both. Um, and what you can might be able to say about that is that um, the, it's, there's an additional Yud. Uh, it's spelled in one of the two times in Numbers 1333 is um, there's an extra Yud. It's uh, Nun, Fe, Yud, Lamed, uh, Yud, Final Mem, Nephilim, in most other places, or in the other places in Genesis 6 4, we just read, as well as here in uh, Midbar 1333, it's without that extra yud. It's just Nun, Fe, Lamed, Yud, Final Mem. So there's an extra yud there, which could indicate that the word in, the, in this, that the word is actually uh, derived from Aramaic. Nephilim would be the plural for that. With a nun sophie. With, with, yes, with a nun sophie, final nun like that. And which in Aramaic, the word nafil means giant <coughs> and not fall. Nafal. So there um, that may be as maybe why giants is a good term for it, particularly if it was derived from an Aramaic uh, source versus a Hebrew source, because perhaps this was I mean, what was you know, we think of Hebrew versus Aramaic. You know, a version of Aramaic was with Abraham when he left, you know, Mesopotamia. So that the idea of the of, of this may well derive from an earlier, may be brought into the scriptures from Abraham, what he knew, coming from Ur of the Chaldees. Just, just a thought. I'd be, I'd be curious as to what the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls may have on it and the uh, Greek Septuagint. Well, anytime that the Desi scroll, anytime there's something important, it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
on it. It's kept people yeah, that, that'll be missing. Uh, <laughs> and the Septuagint says giants. <laughs> okay, so uh, descendants of Anak, and we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and so we were in their eyes. Perspective is important here. First, they saw themselves as grasshoppers, and then they projected that self-image onto the image they thought the sons of Anak saw them. So from this account, you this is very important. You cannot ever underestimate the destructive power of negative speech. They have no idea how those people saw them. They were just speculating because they didn't have any confidence yeah. in themselves. So that's from uh, Tom Mitchell. Yeah, he's retired. <clears throat> Good report. Good report. FS. I'm going to let Wayne uh, explain this because it's, it's really good. Uh, it's important, the word FS there, but he has a really good explanation of this. So when you're reading the, the, the text, and this is this is kind of end of the, uh, the well, it's, it is the uh, transformation uh, from everything before this is good and accurate, just as we were told, it's all great. Here it says, thus they, they're told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Talking about the... the uh, it's just right. like you said it was. It's beautiful. It's just like you said it was. Good food. And then the, the word there, uh, where it's by 20, the translator there is nevertheless, it is Hebrew word, Ephes. 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 Well, probably, probably, actually, probably. Aleph Fe Samech. Fs. Fs. And it's the the meaning of the word sound in modern times. It has a well, at least in my it's, it sounds to me like it sounds to me like the sound of air going out of tires. <laughs> <sighs> like and, a sigh. And like a sigh, like a hard mm -hmm. sigh, because that word fs ceasing, expressing non-existence, meaning if. Uh, everything was true that we, that you you sent us to do. It was exactly as we were told, but expressing non-existence. It doesn't even matter. It's that one word it changes everything in terms of yes, the report is true, FS. But yeah, except it doesn't even matter because these people are huge and they're going to kill us. Right. And so that one so word who cares about these pomegranates? changes. It's good report, good report, and then. Air goes out of the tires. What's the uh, lexicon there, Brown? Bra Brown Driver Briggs yep. lexicon. Yep. Okay. So That's we a good one. Never use that word again. Well, FS. Brown Driver Briggs. Never use the word. Nevertheless. Never, never use that word. FS. It's FS. defeat. Defeatism. <laughs> Eshkol. They came to the Wadi Eshkol. Cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. They bore it between two of them on a pole. Also, of the pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster, the Eshkol, which the men of Israel cut down from there. And you see there the Israeli Ministry of Tourism. You can see yeah. there what they use. That looks more like what it would have been. Right? Yeah, looks Grapes like as big as their heads. You know, that was so funny, man. Claire was like, I think it was about, they were about this big. Oh, man, she's so sweet. <laughs> Doesn't really know, but I gotta figure out how to say it where you can tell me the answer. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Any questions before we move on to Memoir fourteen? No. So you want to go back to Egypt? Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel grumbled against Moshe and against Aharon and the congregation, and said to them. If only we had died in the land of Mitzrayim, or if only we had died in this wilderness. And why is that I bringing us into this land to fall by the sword so that our wives and children should become prey? Ooh. Yeah. Would it not be better for us to turn back to Mitzrayim? And they said to each other, let's appoint a leader and let us turn back to Mitzrayim. And Moshe and Aharon fell on their faces and before all the assembly of congregation of children of Israel and Yehoshua, son of Dun, and Caleb, son of Yephunneh, were among those who had spied out the land, tore their garments. There was a good movie about this. It was called Wagons East. <laughs> Wagons East. Yeah, did you ever see it with John Candy? 
Everybody's was, trying to go west in the his, wagon trains. I believe that was his last people are movie. Getting, yeah, he yeah. died during it. So everybody got scared. Let's go back. And so John Candy's going to lead them back to wagons. wagons. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, they were leaving. And just for the record, it's my personal opinion that the world is a lesser place without John Candy. I, I, he was <laughs> funny. Oh, you yeah. seen Uncle Buck? Great. Oh, yeah. Many times. I love Uncle Buck. That was it. So you want to go back. So, But all the congregation wanted to stone them with stones. Then the esteem of Adonai appeared in the tent of meeting before all the children of Israel. So the spies' report caused despair and panic in the camp. Doesn't take much, right? They wanted to stone Yehoshua and Caleb. The presence of Adonai had to come and personally intervene. Here's here's something I don't get. Yeah. <clears throat> he kills the firstborn because uh, they didn't put the blood on the doorpost in the little. And you're in the camp. You got the doorpost and blood. You see all this, all these plagues happening to the Egyptians. And then you get to the sea. OK, and and the Lord breaks it open, splits the sea in two so you can walk on dry land. And why there's a cloud in front. Them? There's a and, and fire by night, a pillar of fire by night. And he destroys the, 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 the Egyptian army. And I'm like, are you people so stupid? You cannot see what he did for you. If he says he's going to give you this land. Pack up and go. Why can't you believe? Why do you think, oh, they're strong, they're huge? I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? Well, I will say that there's a reason this is in our, our scriptures because I think that is an indication of a short sightedness of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. It's how we are. Still today. Still to yes, yeah, still today. And that was that was the. I, I, I didn't have a, a, a pillar of fire by night or a cloud by day. And, yeah, but how many and miracles I think I was start with one when I was born. That's a miracle. I mean, we do well, this every day. Well, it's just not that. We we all do it, right? We worry about stuff. True. And, we, and but, but I guess. Yeah. But my, my point is, they stood before the mountain right. and the Lord, and they, they blew the horns. I'm like, uh, yeah, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> well, listen, oh, that's not where I'm going, but I'm saying, well, I guess that's, that's where that's you're what going. They're saying. He just had quail. What's the, what's the, what's the problem? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, <laughs> so the, the real sin here is is not esteeming the word of Adonai. He promised he was going to do something, and they They're just... Living in their moment and not in their promise. Yep, exactly. And don't we all do that now? Yes, don't we all do that? And now, so you know, who are we? Million, there's that's, only four people that said, "I'm going." Right. So, in my mind, I, I wonder who are we to 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 pass judgment on them? I'm not passing yeah, judgment. Yeah. I'm saying I cannot understand how you could stand there, know the living God is right there, and His leader Moses is telling you, and you're like. I'm going with you, buddy, because obviously we're winning. Well, in terms of where you are on the tour portions, yeah. missing, what's the mm -hmm. title of next week's tour portion? Korah. 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 Oh, so oh, yeah. It's not, this isn't, we're not at the far, we're not at the depths yet. Yeah. We're still going downhill. We've still got more downhill to go. Oh, great. Yeah. It's not more this, ruin this is, this yeah, we're not as, We haven't sunk as far as we can sink yeah. yet. And who yeah, said going this, downhill this is was easy? the beginning of what... Um, <laughs> Despair and um, and yeah. and worry and um, complaining and just what was that movie? Being um, This is where it begins, and this is what it will yeah. take you through. Is all kinds of much worse things than you are already experiencing. Sure. Pilgrim's so, so, progress. So there's lieu of despond. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a slide in here also, but um, there's one verse in here I have to remember. I should have just put the slide these 10 times. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about these 10 times. I'll just, I'll just give it to you. In the Masoretic text, uh, and I, I think we might, we've studied this in the past, but uh, as a, 
guy who really wants to be a sulfur stomp. 1422 to 24. 1422 to 24, yep. Okay, thank you, uh, Wayne. 1422 to 24 says, for none of these men who have seen my esteem and the signs which I did in Mitzrayim and in the wilderness have tried me now these ten times and have disobeyed my voice. Well, right there in the Masoretic text, there's an enlarged Yod. It's it's big. And, you know, Yod is the smallest letter of the Hebrew mm -hmm. alphabet. So it's just there. And it's if you look at it, it's kind of out of place. And it's interesting that what is the numerical value of a Yod? Ten. Oh. <laughs> you got it. Exactly. It's pretty interesting that that yod stands there, the jots and tittles, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that it's there, that, that that is the place that they have tried Adonai ten times, or he tested them ten times, and they failed the test all ten times up to that point. It's pretty interesting. I didn't include the slide uh, this year, but that enlarged yod is that testimony of that. They tested God that. ten times. Mm-hmm. Man. Is it possible? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I was just thinking about when you should have talked about the less of the flesh, the less of the eyes, and the pride of life. I was thinking if any of those were involved here in why they did, why they came up short every time. Because it seems to, you know what I'm saying? It seems like those things are kind of involved in falling short a lot of times. If, mm. But it was just a, a lack of faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is, lack of faith. Yeah, yeah and these were, it was lack of faith and whining and complaining. <laughs> Not trusting God. Maybe the ten times was the ten bad reports. Well, look what look what happened right after that. <laughs> right after that. Yeah, it is. Uh, right. Look, look, look what happened with the the guys that came back that gave the bad report. They, they died mean. then, right now, done. And the people complained. I but guess. uh the the letter Yod is kind of important in this uh Torah portion anyway, because mm -hmm. what was added to Hosea's name to change it to Yehoshua? The yod. Mm. We'll keep moving. As Clara said. Yeah. Yeah. She got it, man. Yo. I was like, right on. Uh, <laughs> For none of these men have seen my esteem and the signs which I did in Mitzrayim in the wilderness tried me now these ten times. I have disobeyed my voice and see the land which I swore to their fathers. Any of those who scorn me, but my servant, Kelev, because he has a different spirit in him and he has followed me completely, I shall bring into the land where he went and his seed shall inherit it. I'm sorry, it was Lizzie that got it. Yeah, 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 because yeah, she won, right? Yeah. yeah. Different spirit, he followed y'all completely. Compare that with uh, Ezekiel 36, 22, 27. Uh, which, which tribe did Caleb represent? Judah. Oh. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the master Adonai, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my set-apart namesake, which you have profaned among the Gentiles wherever you went. And I shall set my, I shall set apart my great name, which has been profaned among the Gentiles, which you have profaned in their midst. And the Gentiles shall know that I am Adonai, declares the Master Adonai, when I am set apart in you before their eyes. And I shall take you from among the Gentiles, and I shall gather you out of all the lands. I shall bring you into your own land. And I shall sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I cleanse you. And I shall give you a new heart, but put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh. I shall give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you. And I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and shall do them. So is this saying that uh, Caleb already had that? A different spirit. Which different spirit? Different than Korah. Different than Korah, yes, for sure, right? <laughs> Any questions before we move to 15? No. When you sin by mistake, what is the word for sin by mistake? Oops, unintentional. Oops. That's the Aramaic word. That's the Aramaic word. Oops. Oops. <laughs> My bad. Chata. Chata. Uh, let's see. Uh, spoken to Moshe as commanded by the hand of Moshe from the dad, and I gave command onward throughout your generations. This shall be, if it is done by mistake, without the knowledge of the congregation, 
that all the congregation shall prepare one young bull as a burnt offering, a sweet fragrance, to Adonai with this grain offering, drink offering, according to the right ruling, and one male goat as a sin offering. Then the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was by mistake. They shall bring their offering, an offering made by fire to Adonai, and their sin offering before Adonai for their mistake. I think so we'd run out of bulls real quick for me. Make a mistake. It is you are absolutely forgiven for it. Do what you have to do. Stop doing it. On the other side, just because you don't know that you sin, you're going to Yeah, yeah, you're still still a sin, right? Is this yeah. we've talked about this before. I was listening to I can't remember one of the books of Paul and I was frustrated, but I thought oh. this might be what he was talking about. I know there's many different ways to explain what it said, things that you could not be justified by through the law of Moses. And I was thinking about, okay, the intentional sin. There's no sacrifice for intentional sin. Well, we're going to talk about that next, yeah. Exactly. But I was thinking, oh, well, and I thought maybe that Go ahead. might be an explanation, because it seems so contradictory. You know what I'm saying? But, but by that, you know, being justified by, and others, why would, um, you know, that's a whole other ball of wax, but anyway, I was just thinking about that this morning when I heard that, I thought, hmm, maybe that's what it's, it's talking about, through the law of Moses, uh, through, through the sacrificial system, you can't necessarily be justified for intentional sin, you have to go to God directly and just beg and ask for forgiveness, you know. So. Turn from your crooked way. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, in the Hebrew text, uh, the word used here is not actually chata, uh, it's a, a word shaga. Um, Shin Gimel He means to go astray or err. You see it again in verse 24 where it says, if done by mistake, it, the word here again is Shagaga, sin of error or inadvertence. So it, it, is, it still meets the idea of a of chata, it would be a parallel word for it. In the, in the, in the specific context of, of chata as being not the overarching category, but sinning by mistake or error. Didn't mean to do it. So a sin that you didn't, you, you failed to do it, and you didn't, but you didn't know you weren't doing it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Shagaga or Shaga. If the congregation was to fully obey Yah, but its shepherds have taught that certain of Yah's instructions were outdated, legalism and bondage is, is the congregation guilty <laughs> of a mistake or defiant sin? They've been taught their whole life, and they don't know any different. They've been taught, mm, those are outdated. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, that's legalism and bondage if you want to keep on doing that. Are they guilty of a mistake or defiant sin? Depends on if they read it for themselves. Well, even if they did read it for themselves, it's been explained to them, yeah. and they understand it a certain way. Right. Just like we all did for yes. many, many years. Yeah, exactly. So, so I would see that as being guilty of a mistake, but those shepherds are going to be in deep doo-doo. What if the shepherds don't know? Because they've been taught wrong all their lives, too. They're still, they're teaching something wrong that is, um, they're teaching against what the Word of God says. Well, there's a bigger, even though they, even though bigger weight for teachers. Yes, a much yes. bigger weight. Mm -hmm. It does seem, though, that any kind of conviction to change anything about what you believe seems to come from the Holy Spirit and the direct work of the Holy Spirit doing something to make you see it differently. Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I it's studied the Bible my whole sort of life and never realized yeah. and thought yeah. I was doing everything right. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of times though, uh, you've been, you've kind of been taught this stuff. I, there's this one guy I came in contact with when I was a police officer in North Carolina. I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, I guess it's not important, but to give me a definition of what apostasy is. And so uh, in his definition, I'll try to explain as best I can. I, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but I really liked it, even though he, in my opinion, is part of an apostate religion. Uh, he, he said that apostasy isn't just blatantly doing the wrong thing. Apostasy is so subtle of an error in what you're doing that not only do you not realize it, you're comforted by what huh. is happening. 
I really liked it. Uh, uh, spoke to me. Oh, what was that guy? Man. Oh, his name was O. Talmadge Spence. O. Talmadge Spence was his. I don't know. Maybe it was Othan Othaniel or Othaniel, something like that. No, the Talmadge. Son of Caleb. <laughs> yeah. uh, Talmadge Spence. And some of you, if you do any research, you'll see that the name O. Talmadge Spence, E. Talmadge Spence, something like that. You'll find that those names were instrumental in making the Pentecostal holiness church come alive in the South. Those guys. Uh, but I, the, the definition of apostasy is such a subtle error that you don't realize it's there and you're comforted by it when you're doing it. And I, I really like that. And so, so many people for so long, just like uh, the scripture says, mm -hmm. we've been fed lies. We've not yeah. been told the truth. So we want to go with you and because we know you know what the truth is. Our right? fathers have been taught lies. Our fathers have been taught lies. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. But that, in my mind, I, I, you can't ever convince me that at least on, on some level and in, in, to a high degree that Christian pastors don't love Adonai. And I'm not saying that all of them do. I'm sure there are some out there that are knowingly doing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. But they do love Adonai. And I have to believe in my heart that they will be forgiven because they don't realize that the interpretation that they've been taught is incorrect. Mm -hmm. I, b I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and, and But I, I have a serious problem, and I, and I wish that in many cases I wish they could see that when the Holy Spirit tells somebody something that is blatantly against what is in this book, that's a problem. Or if the Holy Spirit tells this guy one thing and on the same subject tells me something completely different, there's a problem. That's not the Ruach HaKodesh. And I, I hope at some point soon that that all comes out. But you can't convince me that these guys don't love Adonai and aren't doing something good. Uh, they may not be doing the right things all the time, but they're at least they're on a track. At least they know that God is alive and that Yeshua is the son of, of the son of that God. So, uh, and that's where we all were at one point. So it's, it's important to remember that. So I, uh, had a friend of mine tell me that a pastor told him, uh, we know Sunday is not the Sabbath, yeah. but if I was to get up there and tell them that and change that, I'd lose my job. That was exactly what happened to me. I took it to a very good friend of mine. He's been a pastor for many, many years. I took him this. He says, I know you're right, J.D., but if I do this, I'm out of a job. Yeah, I, I didn't get that from you, though. I got that from another From somebody guy. else? It, yeah. That very thing. I even told Wayne the same day it happened. I'm like, hey, he, I don't know if you went with me that day or not. Mm -mm. But, uh, yeah. Since, since the Catholics and are I still love the guy. coming out and actually stating that, um, yeah, they changed the um, – they changed it from Saturday to Sunday. <laughs> right. um, they're actually admitting to it, which, I mean, dates all the way back to Constantine. Well, they have it in their Catholic encyclopedia, and they've also well, said this is how we know it's okay. Well, yeah, but, but they denied it for ones. many, many, many generations, and now they're finally coming out. They going, openly yes, denied it, but it was in their encyclopedia. Right. Anyway, yes. it, C C uh asks, even Paul had to be taken aside when the first when he first became a believer, didn't he? To have things explained, excuse me, explained to him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. he did. He thought he was doing God's will. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, all the Pharise the Pharisees that eventually became believers in Yeshua, evidently were not understanding until he enlightened them. You know. Yeah. So. I remember when I was a kid, St. Mary's Catholic Church in Colorado Springs always had a Saturday Mass every week, no matter what. Or so, other ones they have. Yeah, that too. Anyway, moving on. Uh, when you sin by mistake, it shall be forgiven. The children of Israel and the stranger sojourns. Thank you, Miss Cece. You're absolutely right. Uh, because the people did it by mistake. And if a being sins by mistake, he shall bring a female goat, year old, uh, priest shall make atonement, and it shall be forgiven him. But whomever does whatever by mistake, there is one Torah, both for him and among the children of Israel, for the stranger who sojourns in their midst. So is the sojourner supposed to obey a different Torah than the native-born? 
Uh -uh. Who does the sojourner bring the offering? My. So could this commandment have been obeyed during the time of Yeshua's ministry? Um, it was supposed to, um, but the leaders of the church wouldn't have allowed it. Wrong. It wasn't the leaders of the church. <laughs> the people that considered them in <coughs> considered themselves in leadership of the, right. the temple and yeah, there wasn't no, the there wasn't an, leadership. There wasn't a church at the time well, of Yeshua. Well, Thank you. congregation, church, the words actually mean exactly the same thing. It's just a matter of perspective. <laughs> the, they mean the same thing. Um, Not to me. <laughs> Um, well, if he doesn't, if, hey, listen, if he doesn't want his picture taken, please don't take it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, defiant sin and Sabbath example. Here's a good one. This is exactly what, what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but the being who does whatever defiantly, whether he's native or stranger, he reviles Adonai. That being shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of Adonai and has broken his command. And that being shall certainly be cut off. His crookedness is upon him. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And we all know this story, right? They stoned him with stones. Until he was dead. Until he was dead. As Adonai commanded Moshe, and he died. How does Adonai feel about defiant sin? He don't like it. Not at all. Have you ever noticed that this scripture has been formed as a weapon against your Torah obedient lifestyle? Yep. Yeah, I think we all kind of have seen it, especially when you first get into it. Your family and your friends don't understand. Yeah. They, they finally, they just let you go. And like, yeah, he's, you know, whatever. He's Jewish now. <laughs> That's what kind of happened with my family. Uh, so, yeah. so, so but about this, defiant sin. Some of the commandments that we have are very easy to keep. Um. Now, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions. Uh, for example, it's easy if you take the time on Friday and prepare for Shabbat. Make, make sure all your meals are ready to go. You got some hard-boiled eggs for breakfast, maybe some lunch meat or something, or you pre-cooked some turkey sausages or whatever the case is. You got it all squared away. Um, you don't turn your TV on. You don't pursue after your own heart. You don't talk about your job. You don't talk about money. You don't buy and sell things. Just keep the Sabbath. That's If you take the time and do what's right and prepare for it on Friday, the Sabbath is an easy thing to keep. But we'll still see sometimes people, well, I'm going to stop in. Uh, I think I'm going to grab me a hamburger on the way. I didn't get enough of them boiled eggs. Whatever the case is. Now, there, there was a time, I'll be, I'll be honest, uh, uh, even recently, where I'm on my way here and I get a flat tire. And so I've got to stop, and fortunately I was near a gas station, and I worked. I changed the tire on my truck so I could make it here. And also there was another time Colbert, Colbert. where I uh, I was out of gas, and just fortunately by the grace of Adonai, I coasted and made it to the pump to there, and so I had to buy gas to get here on Shabbat. Now, I didn't properly prepare. I should have got gas the day before. That is the truth. And you might say you didn't probably prepare to plan your route so that you wouldn't run over a nail and get a flat tire. I don't know, but it but it does happen. I'm not saying I'm not saying anything. I th I think in that case that isn't that isn't being defiant. That is, I mean, it's just something that happened. It, it, it's getting yeah, maybe it's getting your ox out of a ditch. But to say, but yeah, exactly. Or to say, hey. Uh, yeah, it's Sabbath, but you know we didn't really make any boiled eggs yesterday. Let's let's go get an egg it's McMuffin. Very easy. I've found justify things that you could not be said. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really is. It really is, Jim. Uh, one of the biggest things that this is seems to be a really worldwide problem is food. I mean, it's, sometimes it's tough, I guess, and things are going to happen. I've eaten in restaurants, and so they. For some silly reason, accidentally there's, and you don't realize it until you're eating it, there's bacon in these mashed potatoes. You just didn't realize it. I'm like, oh, man. Green beans have bacon. bacon. Right. So, I mean, it inadvertently happens. 
Yeah. Timmy and I used to get steak and baked potatoes all the time. The um, so on the Wendy's what on the baked potatoes were cooked in lard. Lard. Oh, no, you're kidding. So you just, I mean, it's, but that's not a defiant sin in my opinion. Mm -hmm. However, now that you know it and you go back there and get it, that's a defiant sin. The, the, the Wendy's menu has like two sandwiches total that have no bacon. Right. Mm. So anyway, difference between accidental sin want? or I didn't know and defiant sin. And we've talked about this before, before we're just about done here. But what are the, what are the three words that describe sin? That we've seen, not other than the, the new one that we were introduced to today. Shaga. What do we normally teach? First one, overarching sin. No, that's a commandment. Chata. As in, Hine se ha Elohim hanose et chata ha olam. Then the next one is. You've taught me how to. That's a hundred times. Yeah, but he got the other one wrong this time. Pesha. Pesha. What is Pesha? I, I have memory issues. Pesha so is wrong. defiant sin. Pesha. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Is it I Pesha? know Texas Roadhouse cooks are baked potatoes in lard, but is I'm it, having a baked potato with this day. Is it Pesha or Peshat? Pesha. 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 It's simple. Pesha. Yeah. Pesha. Okay. Pesha. Pesha. And then the last one is? Avon. <laughs> Avon. <laughs> Buying anything from the Avon lady. Okay, it's Avon. 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 And what is Avon? When you teach other people. Yes! When you know it's a sin, but you teach somebody that it is not, and they go ahead and do it. You've just led those people astray, and that is terrible. Avon. By far the worst. All right. Um, let's see what else we got. Glad you guys remember those. Blue cord and the tzitzits. What is the purpose of the commandment of tzitzits? To the tzitzits are to a reminder. They're a straight-up reminder to remember God's <coughs> commands, His orders, you the things that said said do or don't do. do. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not sure about the blue cord. Good. It's, it's the Messiah. It's supposed to represent the Messiah. Mm. I don't know. That. Isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. I never read that. But. Actually, I think actually, I think it was completely So different different translations say different things. Like what we read in our liturgy every week, mm -hmm. it will help you remember and obey all my mitzvot. Mm -hmm. So you don't go from so so the the presence. Be set apart for your Elohim, right? Mm -hmm. But it, like in uh, in the ISR, it, it says. Also might be easier to uh, notice because it's got a blue cord. Yeah, actually. good point. Yeah, yeah. But so like in the ISR, it says. You will remember, and you will. It doesn't say it will help you, or it says a reminder. It's it's kind of, in, in the ISR, it kind of gives you an expectation. Hey, if you wear these, you're going to remember. Is that the case? Until you, until you start, until you touch them and, oh, oh I'm wearing that. Okay, yeah, that's right. what that is. So, so it is a reminder. So it is a reminder. So you're, you know you're wearing TTs, and you get out in town, and you start acting a fool, and people associate you. They see this guy. Hey, that guy wearing them stupid strings from his shirt is acting like an idiot, and that's what they're going to remember. Be be conscious about what you're doing. Yeah. And, and that's, that's something with you know learning. There's like five different ones. They use two right there, just for you to remember. Just remember right. and, be and be set apart. And be set apart. So let me ask this: Make it makes you. Is this an easy or a hard commandment to keep? It's easy. I'd say it's pretty easy. Pretty easy. Yeah. Well, sometimes you may work at a place that has a dress code that will not allow you to wear them visibly anyhow. Yeah. It's true. When I was go ahead. Army. Yeah, when I was in the army, I had to tuck them in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or when I in word or when I was on the industrial floor out of Shepherd Air Force Base in the aircraft mechanic shop, I had to tuck them in because yeah, too many moving safety, parts. Safety reasons. Yeah. Caught in something and take yeah. it with you. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's an easy commandment to keep. I encourage uh any questions? Any answers? Cora. <laughs> um, actually, I think uh, I think I think there is actually a very logical reason so, why we, why the cord was blue. First of all, it would be very noticeable as blue is a very rarely occurring color in nature, as well as that actually has an it actually has a physiological effect on the brain, where you actually become more focused. That's interesting. Yeah, in the science of colors, it's uh, blue actually helps you focus better. 
and, and as, as well as being a calming color. According to tradition, the idea of the blue is the blue reminds you of the sea, and the sea reminds you of the sky, and the sky reminds you of the throne of heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also yellow. Okay. Which, which yellow, yellow doesn't know what it is. Did Yeshua wear tzitzit? Yes. He would have blue to, or he wouldn't have followed all the commandments. Makes you feel cold. He did. Unless, of course, it doesn't specifically say so, but it was. It kind of does. Actually, it does. Oh, it does? It does. A woman who reached up and touched the same garment. Oh, yeah. Grabbed the tzitzit. Is that a trick question? The hem of his garment. Well, that's the translation. Actually. One translation says the wings of his garment, yeah. and that would have been it. Well, that's what the process is. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for this time we've had tonight. We praise you. We ask that you get us all home safely. Let's have a good week, and please heal those of us who need healing. We praise you. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Shavuot y'all. Shavuot If you wouldn't mind helping me clean up, that'd be great. For helping no, us clean mind. up. You know, I was going to say that. Um, it's been hard.